Hello everyone, my name is Abby Endler and I'm the creator of the crime fiction Instagram account and website Crime by the Book and I'm thrilled to be moderating today's Barnes and Noble Midday Mystery event with Hans Rosenfeld to discuss his new thriller Cry Wolf. I'm going to introduce Hans in just a moment here but quickly before we get started I want to let you all know there is a Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions while Hans and I are chatting please feel free to drop your questions in that box. We will answer as many of them as we can. I know we already had a bunch of wonderful audience questions come in in advance, but we'll try to get to as many as possible here. So now to introduce Hans. Hans Rosenfeld is a Swedish screenwriter and novelist. His books are published in 34 languages and have sold 5.5 million copies worldwide. Rosenfeld created the Scandinavian series The Bridge, which is, which is broadcast in more than 170 countries, as well as the ITV Netflix series Marcella. Hi, Hans. It's such a pleasure to meet you, and thank you so much for letting me join you today. Oh, hi, Abby. Um, I'm glad you're having me. Well, I am so excited to discuss your brand new book, Cry Wolf, which just came out in the U.S. a couple of weeks ago. I loved this book so much, and I have many, many questions, but I thought maybe we could kind of start at the very beginning. In case there are folks watching who don't know anything about this book, what is yes. Cry Wolf all about? Well, very short, Cry Wolf is about a lot of drugs and a lot of money uh, <laughs> that is um, that's disappearing in the forests north of Haparanda, where the whole thing is set. And then the people who once owned the drugs and money, they are looking for it, as well as the police. So it's really just who will find it first and what will happen uh, on the way there. And can you remember a particular moment that kind of sparked the idea for this novel? I know so many readers are always curious about, you know, the inspiration behind their favorite books. I mean, I don't think I have one. My <laughs> books and series usually start with a what if question. Um, the, my television series, The Bridge, was what if they find a body on the bridge? What, this was what if they find human remains in a dead wolf? What will happen then? And why, how did it get there? And who is investigating and who is looking? And then you kind of start from there and just move outwards to, till you get the story and the character. So it's really just a kind of what if moment that I'm interested in answering. Yeah, I love that. And now you've referenced the town where this story is set. And I would love to kind of start with a discussion of the setting, because I think the setting really sets the tone for the whole book and sets up, you know, all of the, the challenges that its characters are going to be facing. I mean, for those of us who might not be familiar with, you know, the geography of Sweden, could you describe a little bit about where the town is? Yes, uh, Haparanda is, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of Swedes have difficulty <laughs> placing Haparanda on a, on a map. Uh, it's very far up north. It's the, the most eastern you can come in Sweden. It is right on the border to Finland. Uh, and it's a small town now. It's about 9,000 people living there. Uh, during the World Wars, both of them, it was, it was big. It was kind of the center of, of not all, it was kind of the center of Europe then because it was the only open railway uh, into East uh, during the wars. It, it has had, you know, really glamorous times and now it's slowly kind of declining and kind of you know going back to sleep again and it's uh, it's a fascinating little town uh, that has been big ones in a wonderful surrounding with uh, the nature all around it I loved the setting so much. And I was really interested, you know, I think a lot of the times when I'm reading a Nordic thriller, it, they're frequently set in a bigger city, you know, maybe Stockholm or Copenhagen or Oslo. And I was curious what it is about that rural setting that more, more far removed from, you know, the rest of the country that you felt brought something special to the story. Like why not set this book in Stockholm? Well, first of all, there are a few wolves in <laughs> Stockholm, very few. So I needed to go up North where there's actually wolves. Uh, and then the thing also is, as you said, I, I write other books together with a colleague and we don't have a, a, a place. We move around. We have a forensic team that moves around. Uh, so when I wanted to do or when I set out to, to write something by myself, I thought that I should separate myself from our books as much as possible. So then I said, I'm going to have a town. I'm going to have a place. And then I remembered I, 10 years ago, I was up in Haparanda doing a lecture and I remembered it as a very, very cool, almost mysterious place. So I went there to see if that still was that was still valid. And 
and when I came there, I said, yeah, this is it. This is where I'm going to have, this is where I'm going to put the story. I love well, the story. I loved it. And, you know, I have to admit, so this book, we're not going to spoil anything during this chat, but there is, you know, this major thread in the story about kind of crime crossing the border between Sweden and Finland. Is that based on reality or was that something you kind of just made up? Uh, no, it is. It is based on reality. So far, there are no border controls uh, between Finland and Sweden. It's just a bridge. Uh, and it's literally in the middle center of the city. Uh, you know, you, you take two steps to the left and you're in Finland. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, they have problems. I'm not sure everything is coming from Finland or, uh, or Russia, Finland, yeah. uh, but they do have a drug problem uh, up there, which is, which is real. Uh, but a lot of it is also coming from Southern Europe and going the other way into Finland uh, as well. So, but yeah, there are, there are quite a, quite a lot of drugs up there. So I think, you know, this book for me, it drew me in immediately with the thrilling plot. I feel like the concept of human remains found in the body of a wolf is going to intrigue any crime reader out there. It's good, isn't it? It's so good. It really is. But, you know, I think what I really fell in love about with this story was the characters. And at the center of this book, you have a policewoman named Hannah. Could you describe Hannah to us? How would you introduce her if, you know, if someone were meeting her for the first time? Well, Hannah is, he's, she's born uh, in another town not far from Haparanda. So she is, she is from that area. She's, uh, she's now uh, 54 years old. She's going through menopause. Her marriage is, um, is not great. It hasn't been for most best part of a year now. Um, she also has, she's distancing herself from her children. And then, of course, because it's a crime thriller, we, we realize that there's a reason for that. And she's carrying you know, a lot of luggage and a lot of sorrow from, from her previous life. But she's, um, she's, the thing is, I think she's probably the most kind of, and now I really quote, normal person I've, I've written in many, many years. She's just, she's just a 54-year-old policewoman doing her thing in a very small and sleepy city. I mean, a weekend, a weekend there, the most things that happens are somebody's drunk and falling or somebody hits a reindeer. It's like, right. that's, that's it, right. basically. Yeah. But, you know, I love that she is so normal. I think she's so relatable. She really is a wonderful character. I was curious if you could speak a little bit about, you know, what your experience was like stepping in that character, inhabiting her, being in her life. I mean, what was that experience like for you as, as the writer? I think that's, that's, I mean, apart from the plot, I love plotting. I love the kind of puzzling. But, uh, but apart from that, I also think creating characters is, it's, it's almost like a plot. It's almost like a puzzling, putting different pieces together and see if they fit. And I usually start with very few uh, kind of uh, traits uh, for my characters. And then when I write, they, they, they end up in situations and then they have to deal with them or react on them. And that's where they kind of I said, okay, so this is, this is happening. How will Hannah react to that? Oh yeah, she would probably do that. So I kind of build her layer by layer. And then at the end of the book, she's, yeah, she's, she's kind of a fully fledged character. And if something, uh, then I go back and say, oh, wait a minute, the Hannah that I kind of ended up with, she's not going to do this in chapter four. So I'm changing that so it more coherent with her, her, her development or her character. So I really, I'm not really, they're not fully fleshed out when I start. It kind of happens as I write. And you do something so clever in this book, which is that on the one side of the law, we have Hannah, a policewoman who is working to solve this mystery. And then yes. you create this character who I just was so fascinated by. And she's kind of the parallel character to Hannah, except that she's an assassin and she's trying to solve the same mystery using her own very special set of skills. Tell us about this assassin character and how you came up with the idea for her. Yeah, that's a little, well, first of all, her name is Katya, or at least that's what she calls herself. Uh, and uh, yeah, she, does, she is an assassin. She's been training for more than 10 years in something called the Academy. And where you can buy, uh, you can buy them for missions and then, yeah, they kill, basically kill people for you. So, so uh, I just wanted a little, I thought, I think we talked about this very early in the process. I talked to my, my publisher about it. I said, it would be fun because it is such a small town and quite sleepy. And Hannah is a 54-year-old policewoman. 
what do we, if we kind of land the determinator into that? It's, and that's basically what Katia is, she's a terminator. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, well, I mean, I don't think she's that unique. She's a fun character, but, but yeah, she's a female 20 year old kick-ass assassin. That's what she is, yeah. She's awesome. I loved her so much. And I loved the parallel that you have going between the very relatable Hannah and then this character who feels like she might have just dropped out of your favorite act movie and she's in this small town. I just loved it. And, you know, I was curious when you're writing these characters who have such different and unique backgrounds, is there research that goes into either writing about police work or writing about what it's like to be an assassin? I don't know what kind of research that would be. No, I don't know what I would do either. No, there's, um, I, I did more research for this book than any other book I've written before. Uh, we do usually quite a little research because quite frankly, reality isn't that exciting. And so we, we try, if it works in the universe that we kind of create, then it doesn't have to be the truth. It doesn't have to be real. So, but, but the police work in Haparanda, I did actually research. I had a great contact on the police station up in Haparanda who helped me with all the questions because I think the police work there is a little different from the police work in bigger cities. Um, they have bigger areas to cover. They have a different time of, type of crime. Uh, they, I think they just yeah, they have a different feeling to it. And I tried to get that to kind of really to not make big city cops in a very, very small and sleepy town. So I, I did some research or quite a lot of research just on the police work. Uh, and as I said at the end of the book, you know, everything that is act actual right, that is right police, that's my contacts and everything that's wrong, that's me. Because sometimes I just say, oh, that's too boring. I'm going with this instead. I know that's, it's not true. You're free to do that as the writer, absolutely. I am, as long as it kind of fits the universe, so it doesn't take you out of the illusion that this is actually a place. Right, absolutely. And before we shift gears, you know, I some a small detail that I noticed in the book that I absolutely loved was you really bring Haparanda to life as its own character. You have these chapters, little chapters sprinkled throughout where readers almost feel like they're getting the perspective of the town, kind of as the town is observing what's going on with her residents. Could you just speak a little bit to that, to why you wanted to include that in the story? Yes, I actually, I wish I invented it. I didn't, I, I stole it. <laughs> blatantly, I think from Ed McBain in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where he wrote about uh, the fiction city of Isola and the 87th Precinct. I think it's in some books he let Isola actually have a voice. Mm -hmm. I thought that's such a, especially if you're going to, to kind of create a new arena for everything, that's such a great way of explaining. Because sometimes research on a town could be quite boring if you kind of give it put it in dialogue or put it in thoughts or somebody walking past and thinking about the Second World War or something. Here it is like, she's a character. She's, she's allowed to, to think this. Uh, so yes, I gave her a voice and um, that, was, that was fun. I don't know what the second part of the question was, but- No, that, um, was, that was it. I was just- That was it, your, okay. The motivation behind it, I guess. Yeah, no, it was to kind of set, yeah, to, to create a, a setting. Because uh, yeah. as I said, not many Swedes have been in Haparanda either. Yeah. So it's, it's quite exotic even for us. Well, I loved it. And you know, I'm sure there are lots of readers out there who are very curious to learn a little bit more about you and your background, because you have an extremely unique background that you've brought to this new novel between you know, working on TV shows, fan favorites like The Bridge, which I absolutely loved. And you also, as you mentioned, have a series that you've co-written with another writer. So I was curious, you know, first and foremost, what do you feel are the biggest differences between conceiving of creating a story, you know, for a book versus for a TV show? Well, um, this, I think it's, it's not that much, the kind of creating, the creating part the, the, is not that different because at least because I come from television, I worked with television 20 years before I started writing books. So I kind of just brought that kind of, that how we worked in television and that kind of, we, we do a detailed storyline because when you're in television, you need to do that because it's, it's rarely that you are the only writer. So you kind of need to have a detailed storyline if there are other episode writers uh, on the show. Uh, so uh, we and I do that uh, with the books as well, a very detailed, almost chapter by chapter storyline. 
So when we start to write, we know exactly what's going to happen. So the biggest difference is, uh, I mean, and this sounds silly, I know, but the biggest difference is the amount of words. There are so many words in a novel compared to a script. Uh, a script is just a blueprint with some stage directions and dialogue, uh, but there's no, no, not very often how things look, how they smell, how they feel, how they take. And you know, you have actors to give you all that in a monologue, and and the kind of, what do they feel, what do they think, how do they react to that, all of that. That's that's the actor's job. Yeah. And uh, in a book, well, you're on your own. So, right. <laughs> yeah, the biggest difference is so many more words yeah. actually and what about when it comes to you know writing on your own versus writing with another author in your co-authored series yeah that was also that that was kind of maybe the biggest difference uh that i've experienced in this it's because it turned out i've been in collaborations because tv is very collaborating media and then i've been working with my co-writer michael for seven books uh so I haven't really done anything on my own for, for maybe 10 or 15 years. So I was really, I was shocked about kind of I, how I switched off that part of the brain where I, where I have to solve things myself. Yeah, so right. so the, the biggest problem there was to, to not have anyone who knows the story and the characters as well as I do. Because yeah. with all my other projects, I can always pick up the phone and say, I don't really know about this. Should we think about if we can turn this around in some way? And, and then, yeah, and then we talk and then, you know, because somebody knows the story as well as I do. And nobody did here. So it was just me. Every time I kind of thought, mm, is this the best way of telling this? Yeah. Then I have to think about whether or not it was. And, uh, yeah, I, I set aside eight months to do this uh, wow. book and it took me 14. So it's, um, yeah, much more work than I thought it would be. I love it. Let's see. I think I've got a couple more minutes here before we're going to turn to audience questions. I would love to know, and I'm always interested for writers like yourself who are writing, I imagine you wrote this originally in Swedish. Yeah. What is the translation process like for you? How involved are you in translating, if at all? Uh, not at all, actually. I think my, I think my agent uh, is, is getting some, but then again, um, I think there's only one or two languages we actually can understand when we get the translations. So we're, we're just, uh, no, we're not involved at all. Yeah. So I just got this, to, I think, I think it is, you have a different cover. I think this is the British version of it. Oh yeah. Uh, I got this today. I don't have yours, but the, the, the title is the same. Title yeah. is the same, the content's the same. So. Yeah, same writer, you know, so it's... <laughs> I love it. Now, so Cry Wolf is poised to be the first book in a series, a new series from you, correct? Yes, I'm, I'm currently working on um, number two. It's, uh, it's uh, due to be out in Sweden in late fall, October, November. Very exciting. And do you have, do you have a sense of, you know, how long you see the series running? Is that something that you've planned out in advance? I think the second book, if that is, is going to be as hard as the first one, there might only be two, to be honest. Uh, but I think since I set up the characters and I set up the arena and I set, so it, I hope it will be easier. But um, I haven't started yet, so I don't know. But um, it's supposed to be as long as I think it's fun. Yes, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I'm so looking forward to returning to Haparanda and to these characters' lives in the next book. And now I want to turn to some audience questions because we have sure. a ton of wonderful ones come in in advance. And I see there's lots in the Q&A box as well. So let's start with the questions that came in before this event got started. So James says, the story opens from the perspective of a wolf, which James found extremely unique. What gave you the idea for this? Uh, once again, since it was all about uh, the title in, in Swedish also is wolf related. So it it's, was going to be always going to be a lot of wolf kind of in the title and, and the, uh, also in the kind of well, what we're selling it with was what if you find human remains in a wolf. And so I thought we, we really need the wolf very, very early on in, in the book. And so I just wrote it from the, the wolf's perspective. Uh, and and I have to I say not everybody loved it. My publisher fought long and hard to get rid of it, 
uh, but it's still there. But yeah, yeah it was like just this. it's just a thing. I I needed something else than just you know some hiker stumbling over a dead wolf. I wanted it to be something else, and then I thought, you know, why not have the wolf thinking and dying? I thought it was extremely neat, just like James did. So I'm glad it stayed in. It did stay. I, I did have to fight for it though. Let's see. Hartha would like to know about the character of Katya. She asks if if there is a significance to Katya's name, or if you could share a little bit about why you picked that name for the character. I wish it was. I wish I thought. I, you know, I wish I <laughs> thought things through so much. It was probably just you know googling uh, Russian female names, and yeah. then Katya showed up, and why not? Uh, it. Does it have a meaning? Is is there a is there a bigger meaning to Katya? I don't even know what it means. Uh, I'm going to Google Russia. it after this chat. <laughs> yeah, I am too now. I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Now we had a bunch of different questions that all kind of combine. Um, a number of readers wanted to know more about your research process. I'm curious to know how long did the research process take? As I said, I'm not very good at research. Uh, okay. I have I have the kind of I really think that if it works in the universe that, that you create, if things work there, you don't really, it doesn't have to be the truth because also reality is usually quite boring and especially police work. Uh, so I don't do a lot of research. I did for this one, but I kind of do it as I, as I go along. I don't spend like two or three months or weeks before I start to write. I do research when I need it, when I kind of write something, I think, I should probably know a little bit about this. It will probably be better, at least to know what I'm kind of stepping away from uh, if, I don't, if I decide not to use the research. So I do it as, as problems come up. And then I, I a lot with, with, um, with this one, I called my police contact and said, you know, what will happen? What would you do? Yeah. If, if this happens, what is your reaction to that? And then she said, oh, we would do this and this and this. And I could say, yeah, that's boring. Let's do something else. Or for the whole thing, there's a, there's a telephone. They're tracing a telephone, a mobile telephone at, at the kind of end of the story. All of that is, is research. And this is okay. exactly what you can do. And, and so, yeah, I do research, but I, um, I, I, um, I use it in a very free way, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I totally understand. And not that much, I have to say. Uh, but it seems to work. Whatever you're doing, it's working great. Let's see. Yeah, so let's let's not change that. That's we? right. Just keep yeah. doing what you're doing. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Carl was curious to know: Were any aspects of your writing process affected by the pandemic? Uh, no, it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, I was fortunate enough. I mean, nothing really work-wise, nothing really changed for me because yeah. I was writing a book which is solitary work. Uh, and then I also was starting uh, on a few scripts, but no, and the production was years from now, actually starts uh, this summer. Wow. So, uh, so nothing was really canceled or, or, or postponed. Or, so I was working very much uh, as I used to. Um, yeah. So the short answer, which I'm bad at, is no. <laughs> I wasn't affected. My work wasn't affected by yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. Absolutely. That's very lucky. That's wonderful. And let's see, Aaron asks, um, when you started writing the first draft of Cry Wolf, how long, you mentioned it was 14 months from beginning to end of your first yeah. draft, is that correct? Yeah, I, all, I kind of only do, I, it's different, I think, because when you do the scripts, you really do drafts. You kind of do kind of massive rewrites even. Uh, between the drafts because there's also so many people coming in there's actors and directors and yeah. you know a lot of people have have notes on your work it's not that many people here uh in the book business so um i really do kind of a full book before anybody reads it wow. uh, and then we kind of just we edit it i'd say so uh i don't really do major rewrites i took her out there was a there was a story a personal story for hannah in uh in the first draft then and uh, everybody agreed on it's too much you know you can't have that as well happening to her in this book so that has to go so i guess that was a draft without that story yeah yeah and the upside of that is i now have that story for book two 
That's right. It's built in material for the next book. It's already written. I have like 40 pages there. Amazing. So, that worked out well. It did that work out so well. Let's see. Now you mentioned um, when we were speaking earlier that you do outline your book, correct? That was another question yes. that readers were wondering about is if you write from an outline. Yeah, I do. Uh, and I think it's, yeah, for, it's, it's because I'm from television. It's also because uh, my first books were together with Michael and we had to know what the other one was doing and we had to know, you know what's going to happen because we, you, you can't really be completely free in your writing when you work and write together with someone. So, um, so yeah, I do a very detailed outline of the whole book, almost chapter by chapter. Wow, that's amazing. So that means that you know from the very beginning, you know exactly how you want it to end? Yes, that's actually what, what usually what I start with, uh, at oh, least wow. when it's crime shows. Uh, it's who did it and why, because yeah. everything I or we create after that has to kind of work for yeah. that person or those persons to actually been doing that. You can't have like, but wait a minute, he was in, he was in London when that That's killing right. took place. So we usually start, or at least on the TV shows, we, and with me and Michael as well, we start with who did it and why. Yeah, fascinating. And now Dee would like to know, what was the hardest scene to write in Cry Wolf? Ah, uh, hardest scene. Oh, what was that? I mean, the whole book was kind of a nightmare to write, to be honest with you. But I think I'm, I'm not really, I struggle a bit. I mean, there is, a, there is a sub, in the middle of the book, there, is, there are some murders. And I can say those are probably the easiest one for me to write. Mm -hmm. I think it's because I, I have, I'm, I'm an intuitive writer. I, I kind of, since I have this outline, I know what the chapter is gonna be about. So I kind of play that in my head and then I just type down what I see. So it's like I'm, I'm watching a film and I type down everything that happens and everything they say. Yeah. Um, because I know what the scene is going to be about. Uh, so I think those action sequences, they are quite, they are quite easy. I think there are a few. I'm, I'm, oh, God. Maybe there is a scene with Hannah and her husband outside the police station, which is which I think was um, tricky because they're in such a, they're, they're such an awkward situation there as a couple. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of hard. Most, mostly you can think about, oh, I would probably react like that if I knew this about my husband. Yeah. But this was so out there. So it, it, that, I think that was probably the one to not get, you know, to not make it corny or, or uh, to make it unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's, yeah, the, the scene in the rain outside the police station between Hanna and Thomas, I think that was the, probably the one I spent most time on. Now, Christine is curious to know, to know if you could share a little bit about what first brought you to try writing novels. What was the, you know, was there a moment when you decided you wanted to try your hand at this? Uh, yes. Uh, well, the, the thing is, uh, the, the, uh, I'm going back to the Sebastian Bergman series, which not which hasn't been that usually successful in the US, uh, not at all actually. So uh, that started, uh, I wrote that together with a colleague, as I said before, and that started as a TV show. We, we wrote two scripts, the pilot and, and the second episode of a new TV show. But, and then we went to the broadcaster with it. And at, just at that time, the broadcaster decided that uh, because that was when Stieg Larsson was out, Camilla Lekbe was big. So the broadcaster decided when it comes to crime shows, we are only going to do book adaptations from now on. We don't want any original material from anyone. We're just going to do books. Yeah. So no thank you to this Sebastian Bergman uh, series. So, and then my colleague, when we went out from that meeting, he said, you know, if they're, if they're only going to do books, let's turn this into a book. Oh uh, and then I said, and we said, I remember saying, yes, how hard can it be? And uh, it's pretty hard, it turned out. But yeah, so that's how we started writing novels. It was yeah. because we were rejected. Uh, our, wow. screen, our screenplay was rejected. So uh, we turned it into a novel. That's an interesting backstory. It is actually, it's one of the better why you start writing a book, isn't I it? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> very honest. I really like that. <laughs> so yeah, so that's how we started. And yeah, we... we 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 wrote seven now, yeah. um, so that's that's working pretty well actually. Yeah, 
absolutely. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that was, that was why we started writing novels. I love it. And Carla would like to know, um, what draws you to the world of, you know, mystery and suspense and these dark stories? Oh, I really don't know. I've always liked that. I've always liked uh, crime stories, thrillers, horror. Mm -hmm. um, I think it also has to do with that I was, I don't know if it was lucky or not, but I was always allowed to read and watch anything I wanted when I was a kid. My parents said, said didn't stop me from watching you know, yeah. adult shows or, oh, that probably sounded wrong, but, you know, <laughs> crime shows and violence and horror. And yeah. I, and they say, if you want to watch it, even though you're probably too young, but yeah, then go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I, and I was always drawn to it. I've been, always been drawn to, to horror and, and crime. So when I started writing and I got the opportunity to write what I kind of wanted for television, I, I went there because that's what's interests, what Absolutely. interests me. Yeah. That's a perfect connection to our next question from Gina, who asks, um, were there any thrillers, either books or movies or TV shows that you were inspired by when you were kind of embarking on your career? Uh, Ed McBain, as I said, uh, uh, his, his novels about the 87th Precinct, I thought they were absolutely brilliant. Well, I, I think I've read them all. Um, so Ed McBain was, was a great inspiration. And then... I'm not the only one saying this, but then Stephen King, mm -hmm. uh, he kind of opened a new door how to think. Because always before, if you watched like Scooby-Doo or whatever you watched or, or, or uh, Friday the 13th or whatever, there was always an explanation. There was a, you know, there was a janitor in a mask or there was this crazy person. There was always an explanation. Nothing was really supernatural. And then I, I, I read Carrie. Uh, and I thought, oh, there is, it's not going to be, it's not a hoax. It's not, gonna, she's actually tele yeah. telepathic. And I thought that was so, oh, that you can tell stories that way. It doesn't have to be real. Yeah. Uh, it, it could all be, you know, just your imagination sets the limit. So I think he was uh, like an eye opener for what you could do uh, with writing for me. Yeah. So Carrie, that was 74 or something, wasn't it? So I was 10 then. Yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. Yeah. That's a terrific answer. And I'm curious, this just occurred to me, but I mean, when you were writing Cry Wolf, when you're writing your novels, do you find yourself now thinking about how this would translate to, you know, the TV screen, given your background? No, I don't. I think it kind of comes, I think I write kind of cinematic books. Yeah. Uh, they are short chapters. They're quite fast. Uh, they do like cuts between chapters Definitely. or scenes. So I think I have it kind of coming from script writing. I, I don't ever think of, I don't even think about who's going to watch it uh, or really? who I'm doing it. Yeah, I'm just doing, I think, and so far it worked out pretty well. I think if I like it, if I write the story the way I like it and I find it interesting and I'm doing it, telling that story the best way I can tell it, hopefully there will be more with my taste. Uh, yeah. And um, so I really don't think about I'm writing this for uh, the specific audience or I don't think, oh, wait a minute, we have to cut this in television. That will be too expensive to do. Or I, I just think about the book. Yeah. Well, whatever you're doing, it works. Because when I was preparing for this interview, I started thinking about, I mean, I have such a clear picture in my head of Haparanda. I've never looked at pictures of it in real life, but in my head, I feel like I know this place. I feel like I know these characters. So I think you do have that, like you're saying, that cinematic quality to your writing anyway. So whatever you're doing, it's really working. Yeah, well, you should go. I have to say, you should go. It's I would love to. Beautiful. Not in the yeah. winter, though, because it's, you know, it's... Uh, it's never, it's never, there's no light in four yeah. months in the winter, wow. but during the summer, there's 24 hour lights. So Amazing. I'll add it to my travel list here. You should really, the whole Definitely. that area is, is, is beautiful. Definitely. Now another um, kind of a couple of readers were curious to know about, you know, advice you might have for new crime writers. Is there anything that you would say to an up and coming crime writer? Um, I think you should be, uh, because I don't think that's the case always. I think you should be uh, at least as careful with the characters as with your plot. Spend just as much time on your characters as your plots, because even though the plot is important and it, it kind of drives the story forward, it's the motor, it's the characters that will make people return to your books uh, so or your TV shows. 
So be really, I mean, spend a lot of time on them. Uh, and um, then it's, I think the best is to all, to write. Don't wait for inspiration. If I waited for inspiration, I, I wouldn't have done much. Yeah. It's, to me, it's a job. You know, yeah. I, I'm at the office at nine. I leave about eight, nine in the evening. And in between there, I, I work. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the only way to get it done. Um, and then have people you trust. It's people with the same taste as yours, kind of, yeah, they know what you're aiming for because they have the same, same kind of references. Have people who have the same references as you uh, read it yeah. and, and be honest about what they think about it. Because then, you know, they just, it's not that they don't understand it. It's just that they don't like it. And then you should listen to them. Excellent advice. Now, here we have a comment and question from Lauren. She says, Katya reminded me of the Pete Wilson character on the TV show, La Femme Nikita. Is there really an academy or is this something writers make up for a more exciting story? This is what writers make up for more exciting stories. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, she's a little bit, she's, she's part of it. I mean, she's not the first female assassin. Uh, so, I mean, she's, she's, She's a little bit uh, La Femme Nikita. She's a little bit villainous. Uh, she's yeah. a little bit like all of those. But there are, as far as I know, no academy training them. We hope. We hope. We hope. <laughs> we do hope that's not the case. And let's see. If you had to pick, who is your favorite character in Cry Wolf? If it's possible to pick. Um, oh, that's a hard one. That's like choosing <laughs> between your children, isn't it? It's like... Um, well, I really like Hannah because I kind of, and this is going to sound so silly, I kind of connected with her in an emotional that level. That doesn't sound silly at all. It That's does. It, it sounds really silly. No, but I mean, quite frankly, Katja is more fun to write. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's too different. But, but if I have to choose, I'd say Katja. Yeah. yeah. I think they're both wonderful characters. And I really did love kind of the interplay between their stories. Now, let's see. I think we have almost got we're almost at the end of our time here so if anyone has any additional questions feel free to drop them in the q a box i would love to know hans when you're not writing for tv when you're not writing your novels i mean what kind of books do you like to read you mentioned stephen king have you read anything lately that you love uh, i read a lot of non-fiction these oh, days uh, i stopped reading crime novels altogether uh, a couple wow. of years back yeah because i that, i think around when we worked with the bridge and Marcella, it was like I am living in this kind of police detective world 12, 14 hours a day, yes. uh, seven days a week. I, when I do have the time to read, I don't need to read about it as well. So I, yeah. I put aside all crime novels uh, wow. a couple of years back. So now I'm mostly reading nonfiction, actually, trying to learn something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the latest one was a Swedish book about the big plague in Stockholm, 1710. Wow, um, that sounds relevant. It was very talking. interesting. <laughs> so very, it's, it's uh, amazing, actually, to see how, how similar people reacted 1710 to what they did 2019. Oh uh, so it's, yeah, I don't know if it's good or bad. It's just humanity, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Hans, thank you so much for your time today. This has been such a pleasure. And I just want to thank everyone who's tuning in and remind everyone that you can grab your copy of Cry Wolf at your local Barnes and Noble or online at bn.com. This book was excellent, highly recommended. And Hans, it won't look at this though. That's right. It'll look it like would this look book. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Hans, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to meet you and get to talk Thanks for you. having me. I really enjoyed this. And thank you everyone who listened in. Yes, thank you all so much. All right, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Bye.